All right, so in this video, we're going to come up with an equation for the discrete time Fourier series coefficients. In the previous video, this was the equation that we came up with for the discrete time Fourier series representation of the periodic signal x of k. What we would like to do now is kind of flip this equation around. As written, it's x of k equals a function of dr, where dr are the coefficients we want. I would like to isolate dr and be able to write an equation dr equals a function of x of k so I can actually compute the coefficients. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's actually derive an equation for the dr. So first let's just go ahead and write down the equation that we had for the DTFS representation. There it is. And as a reminder, again, we're dealing with periodic signals x of k which means that x of k has a fundamental frequency omega naught, and omega naught is always equal to 2 pi over n naught, where n naught is the period of the signal, the number of samples it takes for x of k to start repeating. And we're going to try to isolate or solve for dr. So how am I going to do that? Well, here's what I'm going to do. Let's take this equation right here that we know is equal to each other, x of k equals the sum, Let's do the same operation on both sides of the equation, which is a totally fair thing to do. As long as you do the same thing to both sides of an equation, you still have equality. What I'm going to do is multiply both sides by this term, and then I'm going to do a summation. So let's go ahead and do that. So on the left side, I have x of k. I'm going to go ahead and multiply that by e to the minus jm omega naught k, and then I'm going to do a summation over all k. Let's do the exact same thing to the right side of the equation. I had dr e to the jr omega naught k. I'm going to multiply by that same factor. And then I have to leave the original sum I had, so I have equality. And then I do the exact same new summation on the right side of the equation. So I haven't changed anything. I've done the exact same operation, multiplying by this term and forming that sum on both sides of the equation. So this is still inequality. So let's go ahead and do just a little bit of rearranging. A sum doesn't matter what order you do things, so I can interchange this sum with this sum. So that's what I did here on this line. Also, dr only needs to be kind of inside of the sum over r. It can come outside of the sum on k because it's not dependent on k at all. So that's the operation I did there. And then what am I left with? I'm left with this term times this term. When you multiply exponentials, you add their arguments. So that's what I did right there. And they have a lot of common factors that factor out as well, right? They both have omega naught k's. They both have j's. I just was able to write the difference r minus m because there's an r here and a negative m here. So that's just the property of exponentials. And now this term right here is actually kind of in a special form. It actually turns out that this sum is equal to zero when r and m are not equal to each other. So that's kind of interesting. And it's equal to n naught when r is equal to m. So we're going to actually prove this here on the next slide. But before we go there, let's just take a look at what's going to happen. So I have this double sum right here. And I claim that this turns into zero for most cases. So as I'm looping over r here, this is zero most of the time, and it's only when r is not equal, or when it is equal to m, that I get a non-zero value here. So what that ends up doing is it ends up really kind of collapsing this double summation quite a bit. The only interesting case that's non-zero is when r equals m. So think about what happens there. when r, If r equals m, then r equals m here, I have dm, and then this whole thing just turns into n naught. So there's going to be a lot of simplification if this is indeed true. Let's go ahead and now show that that actually does happen. So here's the summation that I was claiming has some very um, nice properties. The first one is what happens when r equals m. So this one's very easy to see. When r equals m, up here in my exponent, I would get a 0 e to the 0 is 1, so I'm adding up 1 a whole bunch of times. How many terms are in this summation? There's a total of n naught of them. So that's, that's the easy case to see that when r is m, this summation actually collapses to m naught. So that's pretty easy to see. 
The other case that I claimed is a little, little trickier, so let's work on that. What happens when r is not equal to m? Well, we can work on that a little bit. Look at this. Due to the property of exponents, e to the j r minus m omega naught k is the exact same as all of that raised to the k, right? The reason I like that is because this now has the form of a geometric series. It's kind of like I have a sum over k of alpha to the k, just my alpha is this crazy quantity e to the j r minus m omega naught, right? But I can still kind of just write down the closed form answer for this geometric series. If you go to your table or just remember it, the sum from k equals 0 to n naught minus 1 of alpha to the k is simply alpha raised to the top limit here plus 1. So the top limit is n naught minus 1. When I add 1 to it, I get n naught. And so that's that value right here. So alpha to the top limit plus 1 minus 1. And then on the denominator, you just have alpha, which in this case is this value right here, minus 1 again. So this is what I get under the case of r not equaling m. So how can I simplify this? Well, let's just take a look at the, uh, the numerator and remember what we know about omega naught. So there's a little typo right there. We know that omega naught, the fundamental frequency, is 2 pi over n naught. So let's look at the numerator here. Let's just tone in right here on the numerator of this fraction. So that means the numerator is this because omega naught times n naught, the n naughts cancel, and I'm left with just 2 pi. So I end up with a 2 pi right there. But r minus m is just some integer, right? r is always an integer, m is always an integer. So I can think of r minus m as just an integer n. I don't know what n it is, but it's still an integer. And then that's very interesting. e to the j 2 pi n, that's always equal to 1. So I end up with 1 minus 1, or 0, on the numerator. And obviously 1 minus 1 is 0. So this sum here, kind of in case 2, always equals 0 for the case when r is not equal to m. So that justifies my claim on the uh, previous chart that that summation actually collapses very nicely. It's only it's only in the case when r equals m that we get something out that is non-zero. What we get out is just n naught. So let's go back to that equation from our previous chart. We'll let r equals m. This is what I had on the left side. On the right side, if r equals m, dr turns into dm, and that sum turns into n naught. And now we are really close to what we wanted. My whole goal here was to be able to isolate d. And now I have an equation right here where that's very easy to do. If I just divide both sides of this equation by n naught, I can easily write d sub m equals this term right here. So if I want to know the mth coefficient, I simply replace m with whatever integer that is, and then I perform this summation to get out one value, one coefficient of the DTFS coefficients. So that is it for now. We have found a nice equation for the dm, the DTFS coefficients. Now that we have that equation, let's go ahead and talk about a few more things just in terms of terminology and what these things mean, just to kind of wrap things up. So here we can go ahead and finally state our overall DTFS definition. Here's the definition of the discrete time Fourier series. It says if I have a periodic signal with period n naught, this is how I can write the DTFS. That's something we've seen a few times before. Now I'm just formally stating it in a formal definition. And now that we've derived an equation for the DTFS coefficients, we can go ahead and state that definition as well. The DTFS coefficients are given by this equation right here. As written here, I've written it as d sub r, the rth coefficient. When we did the math, we got the mth coefficient, but don't let that bother you. m and r are just indexes. You tell me the integer number you want, I plug it into this equation and do the computation. Nothing too profound there. Some other terminology we need to be familiar with, though. Now that we know how to take x of k and compute dr, we often use the terminology dtfs pair. I can go from x of k to dr. These quantities are very much paired up. And they both completely describe the signal. The difference is x of k describes the signal in the time domain. These drs describe the signal in the frequency domain. Also, um, 
you know, we can go from X of K to DR easily. We can also go from DR to X of K. We can go either direction. So we use kind of this double arrow to indicate I can go from time to frequency or frequency to time back and forth, and I don't lose any information. It's just a different way of thinking about or characterizing the signal. X of K is characterized by n naught values in the time domain. X of K can be characterized by n naught DRs in the frequency domain. Because of that, we often call DR the frequency domain representation of the signal because it decomposes the signal into these complex exponential values. These numbers tell me how much of each complex exponential I have in the frequency domain. This representation is exactly what the coefficients tell me. Just also as a reminder, when we have an n naught periodic signal, I have to compute n naught coefficients. Often I think about starting at zero and going to n naught minus one. However, you don't have to choose that range. As long as you just pick a range of n naught consecutive values, you'll be totally fine. Remember, these coefficients are n naught periodic themselves. So as long as I just choose a swath of n naught, I'll get all the values I need. Where you choose that swath doesn't matter, though. Also, in general, um, not too surprising, these d's are going to be complex. So after I compute dr, in general, I end up with a complex number. So that brings up the issue of how do I plot and represent these numbers? Well, what we normally do for complex numbers is we talk about their magnitude and we talk about their phase. And that's exactly what I do here. If I have a set of complex coefficients, if I take their magnitude and I plot them, we call that the amplitude spectrum of the signal. Similarly, if I take those complex numbers and plot their angle or their argument, those are equivalent things, we call that the phase or angle spectrum of X of K. And we'll get some practice doing that now. Now that we have the definition for the DTFS, we can start working some examples and actually compute the DTFS for different signals. And we'll go ahead and get started on that in our next video. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching.